So uh, due to some reason, I, I, I adjusted the title of my presentation and also some content. So uh, now I would like to present uh, my talk about uh, a classification systems developed for, uh, for vulnerabilities in small scale fisheries and how, how fisher responds to this. This is based on a, a global review of literature and um, uh, together with Ratana Chuan Pakte, we, we developed this uh, manuscript. Part of this manuscript is already published in environmental science and policy and other, other part uh, like the response uh, still in preparation. <clears throat> so as we, as, as we all uh, know, the small scale fisheries is, is, uh, is like millions of people are involved in this uh, sectors and it is considered as the ocean's uh, largest employer. Uh, and small scale fisheries, um, is uh, different challenge, which is already manifested in different uh, different talks in these conferences, and this uh, this uh, different kinds of vulnerability uh, became very much evident this COVID pandemic period, uh, where while all all communities are more or less affected, but small scale fisheries are considered as the most affected people, uh, house uh, vulnerable group uh, due to this uh, COVID pandemic. So why do, do we uh, need uh, to, to, to classify vulnerability? Vulnerability is a concept which is used in different discipline and traditions. And uh, so it's, it's a bit complex. It's, it's, available, it's used in like economics, like uh, building structures and different disciplines. So all those factors are not similar, but there are main theme are more or, sim more or less similar. So if we, uh, we, we, we cannot, uh, uh, generalized or make it easier. Uh, so it is becoming challenging to examine the particular vulnerability cases in particular community. Thus, uh, though this term widely used in, in different disciplines, uh, but a, a detailed study of uh, categorizing is missing, particularly in small scale fisheries. The result is the term remain intangible, ambiguous and complex in nature. So, so what are, what are the solution of this complex nature of vulnerability? It can be can be uh, simplified through categorization by selecting and order, uh, ordering things that are identical or different and rank or uh, rationally neutral, which is important to make the sense of world. Based on the literature review, this uh, talk will present a classification of vulnerability factors and response in small scale fisheries. So uh, the, we reviewed uh, 120 publications uh, to categorize small uh, vulnerability small scale fisheries, and and these uh, um, reviewed literature identified 180 factors that serve as source of vulnerability to small scale fisheries globally. In the picture, we could see. Uh, uh, this uh, thematic analysis of uh, these factors, which is, uh, is is on 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 scale up of this 180 factors, we categorize uh, these vulnerability factors into five categories like biophysical, social, economic, technological, and governance. So among these biophysical factors, uh, this uh, weather and extreme uh, climate climatic factors are the mostly used, uh, mostly available uh, attributes in the, in the review literature. And um, in case of technological factors, weak governance and low capacity, uh, low uh, capacity in case of economic factors, this is this, uh, this price taker risk like unfavorable market condition are the most, uh, most uh, mentioned factors in the literature. In case of social factors, uh, low social capital is uh, widely um, widely uh, described as a vulnerable factors, and in case of uh, governance, uh, weak governance and low cap capacity among the fishing communities is widely widely described as the most vulnerable factors uh, in small scale fisheries. As we can see in case of biophysical, uh, through review, we identified seven categories of biophysical factors. I will be very brief, so I would not mention 
uh, AD factors one by one uh, among among those factors weather and climate is the most uh, uh, most um, um, widely mentioned factors in case of uh, vulnerability in case of uh, and uh, followed by hydrological geographical um, and uh, habitat ecosystem fish and fisheries biological hazard and big environment in case of uh, social factors, uh, <clears throat> the review literature reported many socially driven factors posing threat to small scale fisheries. And they are uh, low social capital, user, user conflict, poor occupational health, inadequate facilities, overfishing and unsustainable fishing practice, high dependency on fisheries, and gender issues and bias. Economic factors making uh, small scale fishes vulnerable mostly include unsustainable development, unfavorable market condition, lack of assets, little or no livelihood options, and high fishing cost. Uh, in case of uh, technological uh, factors that contributed to vulnerability are catching power, gear side effects, landing side incapacity, pre sale processing and constraint, safety device inadequacy and vessel incapacity are the uh, dominant factors. Key stressors associated with government factors are similar to those prohibiting small scale fisheries uh, from viable and sustainable livelihood. These are weak governance and low capacity, weak monitoring, uh, control and surveillance, inadequate stakeholder participation, unfair rules and regulations, inappropriate institution, and poor fishers organizations. So among, uh, we also uh, we also reviewed uh, the vulnerability across uh, different uh, fisheries ecosystem. Those are coastal ecosystem, river ecosystems, mangrove, uh, lake ecosystem, island, platform, and estuaries. Among those uh, factors, uh, and we also uh, we also uh, analyze these uh, vulnerability types across a different uh, continent, like uh, overall global, global, globally, and North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, uh, Europe, and Africa, Asia, and Oceania, um, uh, continent-wise. So uh, briefly, we also identified different responses uh, 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 through the uh, review of literature. Those responses are also, uh, also short-term and long-term responses. So short-term, uh, in case of long-term responses, we, 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 we observed that in, in those cases, uh, the policy response and reforming fisheries uh, play the particular roles. And there are some responses which, which uh, which uh, uh, move them to, to more resilience and some are those who, uh, some responses are also make uh, their condition worse like uh, putting more pressure on fisheries uh, ecosystem on which they depend on or they became more in, in depth to money lenders and also all the, so so not all responses are positive there are also negative responses which move, uh, make them more uh, further vulnerable so uh, so in this um, review of literature uh, to classify vulnerable factors and responses, we found that we, we, we feel that this classification presented here would enable organizations and integration of different sources and causes of vulnerability and enhance uh, understanding and recognition of the complexity of vulnerability in small scale fishery. Among those factors, social and economic factors of vulnerability are still relatively neglected. This situation reflects the challenges in fishery research perhaps the reluctance of some fishery scientists in dealing with the multidisciplinary uh, approach with stronger economic and social importance. So those, those, uh, there are some kind of reservation about uh, a social dimension or um, social science research in case of uh, small scale fisheries. So, so majority of the uh, literature we reviewed are uh, single discipline forecasts like uh, uh, they, they focused on one or uh, two or uh, three factors, which we, which we classify like all those five factors. They are comprehensively like all those five factors are not appearing in any of the literature. So most of them are 
single discipline focus studies. So those studies have limitation in their uh, perspective because the, their focus is narrowly on some factor, not all the factors. And uh, so, so this uh, create a single uh, those these those factors define single handedly and articulate the problems and offer any 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 adequate solution to small scale fisheries. So, so as a as as a solution, the, so we suggest that uh, transdisciplinary lens could be particularly use, useful in case of uh, assessing vulnerability in small scale fisheries. So we also hope that understanding of vulnerability classification response could help to design a management framework and state uh, regulations. The classification would help realizing global uh, instrument such as uh, small scale fisheries guidelines and sustainable development goal 14 B related to small scale fisheries. It would also be a helpful first step to look at the vulnerability factors affecting their ability as a small scale fishers ability to secure access to resource and market and it could help decision makers to adopt or rectify strategies towards achieving sustainable development goal 40 as well as other relevant sdgs so thank you so much and for your attention uh, I, I would stop here maybe uh, we could continue our as uh, there are uh, a uh, small number of audience for our uh, session. Maybe we could continue our, our talk and at the final stage, we could receive questions and uh, there will be um, question and answer session. So uh, in that case, uh, I would like to invite our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Sajidul Haq, uh, he will talk about occupational safety and health status of seagoing fishers concerned for small scale fishers in the coastal area of Bangladesh. So um, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Sajidul Haq. Thank you. Can you hear me on? Uh, and uh, your time is uh, 12 minutes, uh, so please try to stick. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, and we can see the, your slide also. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, nice presentation and overview of small scale fishers uh, and the review we have learned. Uh, so now I am. Uh, yes, Abdul Hawk is going to present a title on occupational safety and health status of seagoing fishers. This is a concern for small scale fishers in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. And uh, yes, I know the fisheries uh, is an important sector of, of Bangladesh. Uh, so, in terms of creating job opportunities, uh, nutritional and uh, protein supply, export earning, uh, gross domestic production, especially in the agricultural uh, gross domestic production, contributing more. And uh, uh, among the uh, fish and aquaculture, uh, captured fisheries or aquaculture uh, species, the hilsha uh, or hilsha shade, uh, freshwater prawn and marine water shrimp, uh, these are the commercially important uh, fish uh, and fish species that are contributing uh, to this sector uh, in, in Bangladesh, the commercially important. So here I will talk about how uh, one of the uh, our uh, our uh, in commercial important fish, Hilsha, that is our national fish as well. And because our artisanal fishers or small scale fishers, they are mostly, uh, if, it's, if we classify based on the, uh, based on the species, they are Hilsha fishers mainly uh, uh, in the coastal region. So as a background, uh, yeah, that's why uh, our, I will, uh, uh, our fishers in, in the coastal region of Bangladesh, uh, uh, they are uh, mainly uh, just the background that uh, we have uh, four commercial fishing ground in the Bay of Bengal, so soft no ground, uh, south places, south of south places, middle ground or east of Elephant Point. So these are the uh, commercially identified uh, uh, and this also, uh, but apart from the commercial uh, fishing sector, so we, uh, that is also, where the uh, commercial fishing ground uh, is more than 200 uh, nautical miles. That's our industrial vessels have access there. 
and they are fishing. But now we, as for this conference and also for the, uh, my this study, the additional fishers uh, will focus mainly uh, the additional uh, fishing vessels about uh, 67,000 or 68,000 that's mechanized and non-mechanized vessels in, in Bangladesh. And so among the total uh, fisheries production in Bangladesh, so uh, marine fisheries is coming about 18%. And among them, the artificial artisanal fishing sector mainly uh, contributing more than 80% eh, for the uh, fish marine catch. And uh, about 17% is coming from our uh, commercial uh, fishing vessels. So uh, uh, that's the important thing that artisanal fishers, small scale fishers, they are contributing uh, this uh, big number of, of fish uh, production or fish harvest from the main. And among these, uh, these production mainly uh, done uh, or targeted as the Hilsha fishers uh, in Bas. So Hilsha, it has a get significance, it's a, a geographical index product uh, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, uh, it has an individual of this product has 1% contribution in the GDP of Bangladesh and employment uh, opportunity about more than 2 million, 2.5 million people are directly, indirectly for fishing, marketing, and along the supply chain uh, is involved uh, uh, only for this, uh, for Hilsha. And is not only uh, in the global uh, Hilsha production, uh, our uh, uh, Bangladesh is contributing uh, a measure is more than 70% uh, and uh, followed by India, Myanmar, and, and some other countries. Uh, so that's why the Hilsha and the Hilsha fishers uh, who are working behind this, uh, so it's, it's like uh, say, uh, it's a life below uh, water is our Hilsha and life above water, our uh, fishermen, additional fishermen, they are mostly in touch. And so, but here, uh, Hilsha uh, fishers how, uh, we, we try to identify that what does the Hilsha fishers occupational uh, safety and how they are, what are the hazards or problems they are facing when they go for fishing, uh, uh, especially Hilsha or others they are going for. So uh, here we identified the social uh, hazards, natural hazards, physical hazards of some human uh, made uh, uh, hazards as piracy or uh, pirate attacks, all these things. And finally, we identify that uh, what are the intervention uh, could be for improving the occupational safety and health of those uh, additional Hilsha fishers. So this study was con conducted um, again in my area, post, uh, coastal area, uh, Potuakali and Borguna, uh, these two districts only. And here also we surveyed a questionnaire focus group discussion with the uh, uh, community leaders, especially the fisher, when uh, Arodjar Association, Fishing Association, Fish and uh, Trawler Owner Associations, all those those leaders, and also from you know, Upajala Fishery Officer, Extension Officer, so we have collected uh, same data. So from the result, uh, one of the interesting, uh, what I found is interesting uh, to share that the. Uh, there are number of group of fishers. Uh, in general, we are talking, we are saying that it is a, a, a additional fishers, but they are boat owners, skippers, and mechanics, the cooks, and labor fisher. This means these are the fishers or men who are directly involved for operating net or hauling net and uh, handling transportation of, of fishes. And when a fish, uh, when fishers are they are going to the sea from the shore, uh, a, this lot is completely composed of all these members to make a, a successful trip. And my majority are these uh, fishers. Uh, simply, you can say it's labor because they're just paying their labor, their energy, uh, and others a group. Sometimes they are giving their knowledge, their uh, investment, their money. They are uh, making net and they are buying, purchasing net, net materials and uh, investing for the uh, boat. But that's why income is here. I share that if a boat have, uh, for example, that uh, 1 million uh, taka for 1 million taka uh, they earn, 
because uh, uh, for a tree fishing, this mainly for the tree fishing uh, that I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, previous presentation for seven to 15 days, they will go for. So for seven to 15 days, maybe uh, they costed for about uh, 0.3 million on Taka. And after come back, uh, they just deducted all the fuel, food and other necessary cost. So deducted from the uh, uh, first lot income. And then that amount they divide into uh, 60, 16 uh, share. So 16 share equal to, equal to 100. And in that 16 share, in the summer season or out of winter season, other season, because there is a risk is higher due for the cyclone or some others, that times the fishers get uh, 10 share, but winter season fisher gets nine share. And this 10 or nine share, it, was equ it will be equally distributed to the number of fishers. It's one share per, but the skippers, they will get the two times. So if including skippers, mechanics or cooks or fishers, if there is a 20 person in a boat, this 10 share will be divided by 22. So one share, the skipper, he will get a one share extra and mechanics and uh, cooks, uh, uh, they will get 0.5, 0 0.5 equal to uh, one. This means they are investing um, their time uh, their energy, and but they are uh, getting very small share from their income, and they are, that is the very high risk for the fishers in uh, uh, our hillshire fishers. So uh, that's I found is interesting that uh, we need to work on it uh, because these are the many uh, large number of people are involved here, uh, and their uh, risk uh, occupation. And uh, these hillshire fishermen are mainly uh, under the different age category. Uh, mostly they are uh, from 20 to uh, 50 years old. And, and uh, education that I uh, share also, mainly primary education up to five. And they are, they are full time, measure them. And these fishers are mainly their income, mostly they get uh, the loan uh, from the, uh, these are the some. Uh, uh, local uh, leaders uh, because are uh, their wholesaler associations because they invest they pay for all money and when they come back after fishing uh, they need to pay this, uh, that credit and then this is the one of the uh, barrier for that because uh, they must sell their fish to that uh, person who give them their loan and even at their uh, uh, the definite price right? they cannot go for other cases so the economic loss is also uh, here for the fishers and fishing experience it goes up to uh, more than 20 years and and the fishers additional fishers why they uh, want to be fishers and how they learn so there's the interesting things that they learn from their uh, family or ancestor or neighbors because my uh, their parents i mean their father or grandfather they go for uh, deep sea fishing uh, and maybe some of them, they lost their life, they never come back, but again, they are going there uh, for the same profession. And uh, uh, these are the some um, uh, fishing information they go for uh, in a boat, the queue number from five to 20 is uh, covered. And uh, also fishing duration, uh, five to uh, 15 days. And they go for, uh, because there are, uh, use some artist, uh, I mean, indigenous knowledge, because how, what are the depth, the interesting, they just, uh, you know, if you look at me, I, I extend my two arms, and that is their one unit, it's called one arm, it's about uh, five feet, and they know their length or uh, height of their net, so this how that, uh, okay, this net is about 50 or 60 feet, or maybe 100 feet, or 200 meter is in length, and then uh, by their weight and their um, floating, so they can identify, okay, uh, these are the length of the net and the width of the net, and these are the depth uh, of this water body. So these are the, uh, this how uh, they uh, measure their uh, information that uh, uh, how far they are fishing and fishing distance. They just, uh, they just calculate the oil, okay, uh, I, 
uh, I am running my engine uh, about seven hours, about nine hours from my shore to the south, and then uh, again to the north uh, about 10 hours. So this is how they, they calculate, uh, and then uh, they try to come back uh, at the same way. Fishing gear mainly, uh, they use sea net. Uh, I, I can give you two more minutes. OK. Uh, uh, it, then, uh, so I, I'm going to oh, my main parts there. Uh, what are the safety devices they use? They mainly, the com for the communication, they have only compass and radio for weather warning uh, signals. Uh, that's the then other no radar or GPS nowadays. Uh, recently, uh, some of the about not more than 10 or 15 percent boat are using GPS. And the most important of, of natural of uh, hazards, the cyclones, storms. These are the important uh, safety factors and social factors: poverty, uh, food insecurity. These also makes them the uh, uh, risky in the profession and human factors. That's called uh, pirates attacks. So these three figures, you will see the natural cyclones attacking. And this is the picture that uh, one of the rover, uh, they attacked uh, this fisherman. So that are the uh, mainly uh, social, natural uh, safety factors are concerned. And natural factor, as it was the most important uh, uh, and critical one. So we surveyed, my study was conducted in 2019, but uh, from 17, I got uh, this response from the fishers you see a different cyclone in different years, Pony, Bulbul. Uh, so many Bangladeshi or Indian people are very aware of that. But right now, Oshuni is also, uh, I'm looking for this information, this kind of uh, summer, or there are uh, many uh, that cyclone uh, uh, causing for the uh, fatalities. That's the main. But other health hazards also occurred for, for the fishers. And then during the fishing, sleeping by the uh, nets and also rope, they have also the uh, similar. These are the uh, uh, injured by the pirates attacks. And these are the some, these are during the fishing or by the engine or net uh, or some other uh, uh, injured, physical injured happened for the additional fishers. And also physical hazard or health hazard, mainly the their ear problem for the noise from the engine and eye uh, reddening, and also the, the health hazards or problems are different during fishing, especially dehydration and uh, uh, diarrhea, and also after fishing, uh, uh, there are the uh, significant and problems uh, uh, the fisher uh, faces. And uh, uh, for the uh, safety supports, I want to finish in, in a minute that uh, mainly uh, they use some uh, life jackets uh, and uh, uh, boy, uh, very less time and uh, first aid, they just take some uh, medicine, uh, primary medicine uh, for their headache or fever uh, for this kind of uh, uh, problems, yeah. but uh, uh, not much. Uh, so this in this case, for improved safety, much improvement needed and so uh, needed their training, their awareness and also safety devices uh, are very important uh, for the uh, fishers. So uh, that's how uh, I want to conclude that. Uh, Hilsha fishers in Bangladesh, uh, they are uh, significantly contributing to the national economy, uh, but their and the risks and the risks is among them is the cyclone is the uh, major one, and also the physical uh, hazard caused by or health hazard caused by the during fishing and also by the pirates is also the important uh, one that need to be uh, uh, addressed and government and non-government support is. Need to. So life support, life insurance, boat and net insurance, and uh, uh, GPS or IT devices, and coast guard security, government non government safety intervention are highly recommended. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Sajidul Haq. Uh, your presentation nicely portrayed that the very uh, true nature of fishing profession, which is very risky, not only due to natural causes, but also human induced causes, which is very much prevalent in case of Bangladesh. Thank you so much. Uh, so our um, next uh, speaker is um, Alice Joan Ferrer. Uh, she will talk about um, medical park in the Philippines, uh, push small scale fishers out of or far into the water. So Alice, uh, uh, floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Can you see now? 
Okay, good. Okay, so anyway, yeah. this is my um, uh, cover slide, and uh, you can see the title of my presentation, Mariculture Parks in the Philippines push a small scale fishers out of or far into the water. So I was uh, with a group who worked on this uh, um, project. So you can see the names. Uh, as I have mentioned, this is uh, chapter 25 in the book on uh, Blue Justice uh, released by uh, TBTI last uh, March. So uh, this is uh, the outline. So I will bring you to the Philippines, uh, present to you the Bal Balingasag Mariculture Park, and then uh, give you briefly the methodology, how we did it, and then uh, show you that we use the interactive governance approach here in the paper, and then a little on discussion and then conclusion. Okay, so this is um, the slide that's showing you all the mariculture parks in the Philippines. Uh, well, of course, uh, mariculture existed uh, since the 1970s, but it was only in the early 20, 2000 when mariculture park, it's a different from mariculture, Mariculture Park, Park became um, um, a big program by the Bureau of Fisheries and uh, Aquatic Resources or by the government. So the Mariculture Park follows what they call this industrial estate concept where the territorial waters are delineated or zoned to mariculture business operation, business park or special economic development. So possibly, to avoid conflict with fishing activities and other uses of coastal and marine waters. So that's the idea of a mariculture park, industrial estate, but of course in the waters. And then this is the mariculture um, uh, park uh, where we have where, that we have studied, the Balingasak Mariculture Zone. Uh, this is a 195 hectare development um, or mariculture park. And then of course you can see there the divisions. So here um, we have seen that the mariculture parks have created distributive and social injustice, uh, especially in the context of the small scale fisheries. So the paper actually looked, looked at how the establishment of this mariculture park has compromised the access rights and the well being of uh, the small scale uh, fishers and uh, have identified what needs to be done to restore equity, access, participation, and rights. Here in the Philippines, when we say uh, small scale fishers, they're the ones fishing using uh, boats or no boats, or if they have boats, uh, three gross tons and below. So really small boats uh, uh, that they are using. And then uh, they may be using uh, passive gears or no gears at all. So um, the, as mentioned, the mariculture parks uh, were um, established in the early uh, 2000. Uh, with all these desirable goals, uh, generation of uh, employment, of alternative livelihood, and so on and so forth. So good things are expected from this uh, mariculture park program. But of course, the poor implementation of uh, the mariculture park have created a number of injustices. So supposedly to resolve conflicts, but it created new types of conflicts. Okay, so what we did, actually we had already the data um, for another big project, but uh, of course uh, when uh, Blue Justice um, uh, was, uh, became mainstream and, you know, or maybe not really mainstream, but uh, during that uh, 2018 um, uh, World Small Fisheries in, uh, in um, Chiang Mai, then I thought of looking at uh, this uh, data set again so we had a uh, data set of 27 key informants, seven FGDs involving 50 men, and then we have a survey of fishers and non-fisher uh, households, and then a number of um, data from secondary sources. So we looked at them using the justice lens, and then this paper came out. So this is uh, where uh, Balingasag is located. So it's in northern Mindanao. So this is the map of the Philippines. So you can see that uh, here is uh, Balingasag and that's, uh, that's where the Mariculture Park is located on this uh, part here. So it occupies 16% uh, of the whole of the Makahalar Bay. This is the whole of the Makahalar Bay. And the main problem is the, uh, the low and declining catch in the area. So uh, this is just to show you the characteristics of the fishers in Balingasag and then just take a look at, at this lower portion here. 
So they are really poor. And of course, uh, in the whole country, uh, the, the small scale fishers are among the poorest uh, uh, sector in the country uh, based on the poverty index and so on. And then uh, you can see that they are uh, late, uh, in their late 40s. Uh, we have uh, covered male, female uh, fishers here. And then uh, maybe you can, it would be interesting to see here this one that the, the, those fishers that we have covered are 60% uh, uh, were dependent on uh, fishing really. And then um, uh, these are also the kind of uh, net of gears that they are using and so on. And they've been fishing for um, about 30 years. So just to give you an idea of uh, who are these uh, small scale fishers. And then uh, take a look at the um, investors in the uh, in cage uh, culture in the Balingasag uh, Mariculture Park. And then this was the first uh, data set here. You can see as of July, 2013. So we had um, uh, 114 cages. Uh, so they are small, medium uh, investors here. And then uh, so 191 uh, cages all in all during uh, 2013. And then uh, during uh, January, 2014, we had 203. So the number, uh, increasing so with uh, 63 investors but the problem of course here this 63 they are not really from Balingasag but they are from other areas these are people who can really afford cage uh, culture but uh, then uh, we have here uh, January 2015 uh, the number fell from 63 to 38 really because of uh, in uh, De December 2014, there was a big typhoon and uh, a number of uh, the cages uh, were destroyed. So from 203, now less than 113. So that's, uh, And then uh, this slide uh, will just tell you that uh, the activities in the mariculture park area really declined. Activities such as gleaning, this uh, part here, this is gleaning. So the blue is before the mariculture park was established and then during. So you can see the decline in gleaning activities. Uh, this one is for non-fishing households during the time when we conducted the survey. As you will see, some of them have uh, left uh, fishing. Some of the those, uh, they are now non-fishing households but before they were fishing households so for fishing households they continued fishing but of course they were and you will see in the next slide that they are now fishing further uh, from um, the coastline and then here are the leisure activities so decline so this is swimming this is playing by the beach a strolling so all are going down so uh, this is for the non-fishing households and this is for the fishing households Okay, so this one is about displacement, showing you that uh, a number of our fishers got displaced from their traditional fishing ground, because of course the, the, uh, the traditional fishing ground is now uh, the mariculture park. So uh, you will see here um, those uh, fishers near the mariculture park area, non-mariculture park uh, barangays, living in non-mariculture park barangays, they were saying that uh, before this is just uh, where they go for 0.5 or 4.5 kilometers, but afterwards uh, farther into the sea. And then for those fishers living in the mariculture park uh, barangays or area, then you can see that they are now fishing farther into the sea. Um, then of course that would show us uh, they've been displaced from their traditional fishing ground. Uh, the fishers are not allowed uh, within 100 meters uh, from uh, the cages. And then, of course, uh, this is the governing system. So we have an executive management council managing the, the, the mariculture park. And But of course, we want to highlight here that most of these people in the uh, management council are from the... More. Two minutes, okay. From the, <laughs> from the... From the... Well, of course, the governing system, they're mostly from the government and there's only one representative from the small scale fishers. Okay, so now we have really very poor interaction uh, between the governing system and the systems to be governed. And this, of course, um, brought these injustices. So the two kinds of justice, injustice that we have um, identified, this distributive uh, injustice. So the fishers were no longer allowed to access their traditional fishing ground. And then, of course, the social injustice, because 
the rich and the non-locals have replaced the, the locals in using the, the marine area. And then, of course, the participation of small-scale fishers and other local residents are very uh, small in uh, managing this or even in decision-making uh, regarding this area. Uh, so what we have uh, seen here is that a ca the case of Balingasag, which is about mapping, zoning, or fixing, or allocating space for different resource users, um, have created injustices and inequities rather than promoting community welfare. And uh, the poor implementation really broke the promise of uh, the Balingasag um, uh, mariculture part. So supposedly to reduce conflict, but indeed, um, created more conflict. So these are what we need, uh, more participatory, um, transparent approaches. And of course, uh, we see that, uh, of course, establishment was a social process. And then uh, we saw that the expectation was very different from reality. So of course, the hierarchical mode, the uh, management council did that serve well. Um, the purpose of the Balinga Sagmariculture Park. Uh, the essentials of blue justice, it's three things here are not uh, found. And then, um, um, it, well, I will just say here that the case of Balinga Sagmariculture uh, Park illustrates uh, vividly uh, the two injustices, the social and the distributive justices. So I think uh, that's it. Um, so yeah, the case offers opportunities for improvement and guidance for changes to be made in Balingasag Mariculture Park and of course for the whole uh, Mariculture Park program of the country in general. So I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll stop share now. Yeah, thank you very much, Alice. Uh, this is a very nice presentation uh, highlighting how different conservation report uh, with the stated aim to do benefits to the fishers actually do more harm to them. Thank you so much for enlightening us with um, further knowledge regarding this. So um, we have uh, our next presenter, uh, Advina Garchi Turena. Uh, apology if I pronounce wrong your name. Uh, she, uh, she'll talk about uh, building fisheries resilience through multi-species um, management. So Advina, floor is yours. Please proceed on. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Give me a moment. Um, can everyone see? Yeah, yes. we can see you yes. and hear you also. Yeah, please proceed. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Edwina Garcia and I'm here to present EDF's work in multi species management with a focus on initiatives in the Philippines. Uh, so, most of the theory and practice of fishery science and management focuses on single species management, but however, in reality, uh, for instance, so this is a, a skipjack fishery in, uh, in the Maldives, and it's a pole and line fishery. However, um, more often in reality, multiple species are caught. Uh, at the same time, using the same gear. Uh, but however, the non-target species are often ignored oh, and different species are caught at the same rate. Uh, for instance, you know, in the same skipjack fishery, you may also see yellowfin and rainbow runners, but these are not the target species. So therefore they're, they're ignored even if they're caught and there's fishing pressure on those species as well. Uh, so the challenge of multi-species fisheries is that, you know, multi-species fisheries are predominantly small scale uh, and are very complex with fishers having different goals, different capacity, scale, and gear. Uh, and this complexity makes science-based and adaptive management quite challenging. And it puts food sources, jobs, profit, uh, community livelihood and culture at risk. <clears throat> One of the bigger problems that uh, the single species management approach uh, reveals is that, that uh, managing species, one species and ignoring the rest can result in what we call serial depletion 
in which uh, higher trophic species are overfished and then fished out and then replaced with lower trophic species. Uh, and this is also known as fishing down the food web. Typically, large, tastier fish are easy to catch and are depleted first, then smaller, more cryptic species are depleted. And finally, the small pelagic species and invertebrates are fished down as well. <clears throat> so this is called serial depletion. So in managing multi-species fisheries, we must strive not only to produce good yields from healthy, resilient single stocks. Um, we should also try to avoid cereal depletion and prevent adverse impacts of fishing on marine ecosystems. <clears throat> this is a bit of a tough challenge, I think. <clears throat> so to overcome some of these challenges, uh, EDF has developed a new approach called fish baskets which is, and, it, and that approach is guided by uh, EDF's framework called FISHI uh, or Framework for Integrated Stock and Habitat Assessment. <clears throat> the, instead of assessing and managing each stock separately, stocks are monitored and managed together based on their risk to ecosystem, the vulnerability to harvest and their depletion status. So instead of creating fisheries management plans for each individual species, fish are monitored and managed within their respective baskets, making multi-species management more realistic and even in data limited fisheries. For instance, we are working on different <clears throat> uh, types of fisheries in different parts of the world, such as Belize, Chile, Cuba, and then Indonesia, Mexico, and of course, the Philippines. Uh, and these many of these, these fisheries are data limited and with differing governance structures. And we're talking about both fin fish and invertebrate types of fisheries. So looking into the Philippines or into the, the, uh, our work in the Philippines, uh, what we are doing is uh, focusing in a, a one of the country's fishery management areas or fishery, man, ma, uh, fishery management area A, which is one of the poorest with high, uh, so one of the highest poverty incidence areas with, uh, and uh, since it's on the Eastern seaboard, it's very vulnerable to typhoons and extreme weather events. Uh, and of course, also to, to climate change. And we're, the, the, the fishery management area is characterized by several types of fisheries you'll have reef, demersal, and pelagic. So then this slide and the next two slides are basically talking about one of the first steps that we do to help define what goes, which species go into a basket. So the first step, as I was saying, is called the, uh, an ecosystem, uh, a risk to ecosystem assessment. And it's based on a tool that we have called CARE. In this slide, you'll see that, that um, the current and uh, the, we're measuring current and anticipated ecosystem risks with a focus on pelagic ecosystems. And this includes uh, climate impact, recovery, and resistance uh, risks. <clears throat> and the other the other aspect of looking into risks to ecosystem are identifying your three or four main threats. And these are usually identified by a multi-stakeholder group uh, that we bring together to do the, to, to make use of the tool. And in this case, we uh, the stakeholders identified illegal fishing, marine debris, and legal fishing as the three top threats to their fisheries. So again, these are weighted scores. Uh, and they are uh, accomplished, the, 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 the process is accomplished by a group of, of stakeholders to the area, including your government agency representatives, uh, fishers, um, the academe, local government, and, you know, and, and other, other stakeholders that, that uh, uh, can come together to do a face-to-face -face interaction and really debate this and you know argue out all the different weighted scores for the different different attributes. 
<clears throat> so finally, this is just a, a, a little little summary of, of some of the work that we did in, in FMA8. And it really shows, of course, that the, the current impact of climate is already quite extreme. And then if we look at the next five to 10 years at the anticipated impact, we're talking about a great increase in magnitude of the risk. The next step that we do to help define which species go into which baskets is called the vulnerability assessment, which I think um, our first speaker maybe spoke about as well. Uh, and uh, the, this step assesses the vulnerability of the stocks to to different uh, different uh, gear and um, <clears throat> and different conditions. So this this uh, the attributes of growth rate, length at maturity, and uh, susceptibility to fishing gear, etc., are are brought together in this in this activity or in this tool, and fish are then grouped by susceptibility and productivity. So in this example, we have the nurse shark, spotted eagle ray, Nassau grouper and reef shark, which would be in the high vulnerability category. And then you have uh, some hogfish and snappers in the medium vulnerability, and then some uh, parrotfish and angelfish perhaps in the low vulnerability. So this, this tool, the PSA, helps to determine the relative status of stocks and how they are impacted by, by fishing activities. The, the, the third, uh, the third uh, element that goes into determining which fish go into which baskets is of course your stock assessment. And uh, these in the Philippines, we use primarily length-based analyses uh, coming from fisheries dependent and length-based data streams. So uh, we have in the Philippines some data in some areas from 1998 and some areas later, and these were unutilized and unanalyzed. So a lot of our work in the Philippines has been on, on helping, helping the stock assessment program to analyze its data and come up with information that can be used for management. The, the performance indicators that we are working with primarily are sustainability and seeds, um, including biomass, length at maturity, and then we have fishing mortality, uh, CPUE, and uh, spawning potential ratio as well. So all of these different uh, types of information go into determining your fish basket. So in, in, uh, in terms of looking at the actual prioritization of the baskets, right, we start with <clears throat> Uh, stock status, vul again, and then we look at vulnerability and climate, and then we also then look at different stakeholder preferences that come into play. So this is an initial identification of the top 20 species in an area in FMA8, and you'll see that uh, E. heteroloba, which is an anchovy, comes uh, into, uh, comes quite high up, and you have also a, that's a fusilier, uh, uh, sea cunning, and then you have N hexadon, which is a thread fin bream. But if you look very carefully on the left side, uh, these are the attributes that we're looking at stock status, vulnerability, uh, climate impact, etc., that we talked about earlier. And then we also add in uh, more socioeconomic information that can be weighted as well, such as value, um, your supply. Uh, distribution within the FMA or fishery management area. And then you also have some species have a high cultural value or, or other type of, you know, less, less quantifiable, um, uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, less quantifiable, but definitely uh, important attributes that need to be also weighted and measured. Edwina, you have uh, two more minutes. Got it. So we, uh, once all of the different information is put together, what you end up with is a very different set of, of uh, different list uh, with, again, stale heteroloba on top uh, and the other two species following closely. So just to move forward, what we've seen here, the, the last element that we look at is uh, gear influence on the fisheries. So we have the five-year landings 
by gear, and then also by sector, small scale or commercial. And in the end, what came out for this particular basket was an anchovy basket, uh, which was consistent, which consists of two anchovies, two sardines, and a squid. And basically, these have similar, similar uh, life cycles or are found in the same place at the same time or are, are susceptible to the same kinds of gear. So if you'll see the, the, in the scoring, the anchovy did, uh, scored quite high and the rest are still in that basket as well. So the, the key here, of course, is that once the baskets are formed, you come up with the measures and the, the harvest control rules and measures that, that will uh, regulate or, or, or guide the fishery uh, and the activities within the fishery. And the goal, of course, is to have an adaptive management plan in which all of the information can be reviewed and uh, all of the policies can also be reviewed and assessed for, for a success rate over time. And, uh, and hopefully with increasing information, increasing data, different streams of data, you will get better management, better information, better management over time um, as you go through the cycle more than once. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Advina, for your nice presentation. And uh, this is, looks uh, really a novel concept and framework to, to assess and also to provide solution to fishery crisis. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so our final speaker is um, Shishi Kanta Pradhan. Uh, he will talk about uh, reimagining value in dried fish um, value chain as a well-being by applying SES lens. So Shishi, uh, floor is yours, please. Uh, just a minute. I am just getting the... No problem, yeah. Just take your time. Is it visible now? Yes, we can see your slide and also we can hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just thank you. Oh, it's, uh, presentation mode. Yeah, it's now fine. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful presentations to, to set the context of my presentation. So, generally, uh, when we think about value chain, uh, so the discussion goes more into capital, market, revenue, and income. And there is very little discussion about well-being and well-being in terms of justice and uh, and this whole uh, differences that lies within the chain, chain, variations lies within the chain, who controls, who manages, and those kind of issues. So um, I've tried to look at these issues uh, in this uh, work. So I've been, uh, I'm a student in a PhD candidate, final year PhD candidate with the University of Waterloo. And uh, my work is on value chain in Eastern uh, Bay of Bengal in India. So uh, the, the problem context which I, uh, I look at is like the value chain, mostly largely look at economic multiplier effects, uh, effects and it is, it is about competitiveness across the scales. Um, that leads to have a very strong financial perspective in value chains which uh, actually limits its scope to embrace this non-capital and non-trade relationships um, that is actually exist in the fishery systems, which we have already discussed in previous two presentations. Um, further, this trade emphasis uh, on revenue creations, because that's a singular motivation of value chain where in each node and a segment, the value has to be multiplied and each actor has to benefit in terms of revenue. Uh, so uh, when we talk about value chain performance, optimization done through labor cost efficiency technology, mm, uh, and also in some places there is a whole, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk on that about there is um, expanded bill of material structure. So same product used for different kind of purposes, uh, which generally doesn't help the poor uh, who have been actually in the extractive end of the value chain who are working on dried fish or uh, small fish sector. So uh, there is a whole power asymmetry among the uh, value chain actors, uh, which is resulting from unequal distribution of benefits. So in that sense, um, uh, if we look at these uh, upper end value chain actors, 
they are just mere contributor to the value chain, but the largest share of benefits goes to uh, trade and uh, and wholesale segment. So uh, what I did is that I have taken three theoretical approaches to understand the issue. One is social ecological system approach, second one social well-being, and third one is value chain. Um, so what I did, uh, this is the area where I actually concentrated my study. This is Odisha and West Bengal coast of India. If you have an idea about the Indian, uh, it is the eastern coast of India. And beyond that, it will go to Bangladesh and down below it will go to South India. So this is a place um, where Odisha and West Bengal, uh, if you look at West Bengal is the second largest in Odisha, is the fourth largest fish producing uh, state in India. Um, the, 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 dry, the marine fish production is a declining trend. Uh, it's actually everywhere, but uh, in, in this place, uh, there, are, there are so many um, issues in, on the hand in the marine system. So the production is going down. Um, uh, since I look at dried fish, about uh, 3% of the total fish production in Orissa and 6% of the total fish production in West Bengal goes to uh, dried fish. Uh, however, uh, if you look at only marine sector and mostly dried fish is done through marine um, catch, so it's about 16.45% in Orissa uh, in both the, uh, for marine sectors. Uh, the irony is that there are 163% tries in vessels in Orissa uh, over the last one uh, decade. Uh, and about 41% rise in, uh, in fishing vessels. So there is a whole lot of intensification is happening in the space. And uh, out of that, the share of non-mechanized motorized crafts and traditional crafts is very high. If you can see the figure is 85%. They are actually uh, very, very small operators. Um, and, uh, and about, 15% um, are only the mechanics sector having a kind of a boat capacity more than 20 HP uh, or uh, trailers and other uh, high uh, mechanized uh, boats. So, uh, however, if you look at there are 85% and their share, share in the production is about 49%. So that shows the kind of catch for unit is actually very little and going down in terms of uh, uh, these small scale uh, fishes. And there is high fluctuations in um, production. Uh, so if you can say standard deviation is really, really um, high. And then fishing ban, uh, Orissa is a typical state where uh, this coast is typical where we have Olive Ridley uh, conservation initiatives. So, so here we, and there are marine parks and here the ban is for seven months and the ban is not uniform for all. So uh, for uh, coastal waters, there are uh, traditional fishes are banned up to seven kilometers. Then this whole uh, five kilometers shoreline and then motorized boat less than 8.5 uh, meters uh, are banned for 10 kilometers. And then, then these uh, trailers and other, other uh, mechanized Boats are banned for 20 kilometers from the coastline. And that gives a very interesting picture. Since there are seven months ban, these big operators are also having the small vessels and operating in this. And they're competing with this uh, traditional fishes. So that gives a new dimension. Why I am, uh, and if you look at this inland and marine fish production uh, comparison, this sector itself is taking a back seat as the sail of the total production is marginalized. And there is a whole getting marginalized and whole focus on, uh, on um, strong programmatic focus on aquaculture, mariculture, case culture, and those kind of things. Uh, and you can see the pie of the marine uh, uh, capture is reducing uh, over the years. And if you just put it data a little long term, you will see the kind of drastic change happening from 1990 onwards. And there is also a huge focus on uh, candidate species, Orissa uh, and West Bengal. Here, shrimp has been a shrimp, and uh, our fellow local league has presented in West Bengal. There is a whole efforts to rejuvenate uh, this uh, Hilsa sad. So, there are 74.8% export from one species that is shrimp. So, entire policy 
and investment everything is geared towards export and stream production and there are new new species are getting in benami is the new one which has come to space so um, if you look at um, why i am looking uh, saying this uh, this fisheries in the dried fish discussion um, because uh, there is a full mixed identity. The people here, uh, these are not very separate operations in terms of small scale. The people who fish in the in the uh, she, they also process, and they are they have the role of fisher, processor, sometimes traders. And if the male member is going for fishing, the woman is processing at home. It's more of self uh, small scale disposed operation, mostly self employed uh, enterprises with women taking central role. Uh, these are also heavily dependent on artisanal and non-mechanized motorized sector uh, because uh, these are small scale and uh, and the larger kind of a small um, uh, they depend on uh, low value small fish so they are heavily dependent on them um, and there is also fuzzy boundaries of nodes like. Um, Earlier, there is a clear, uh, in, in, in other market systems, if you see there is a clear different, different uh, operational divisions in terms of nodes and roles, but here it is all diffused. The, the people who are actually, there are the multiple interactions happening within and across the nodes. And then community, uh, the whole commodity value chain approach which is adopted here have uh, power asymmetry among the chain. And if, if uh, I think all of us have worked on market systems uh, framework and when market systems framework, we call it, there are a lot of vertical and horizontal in, uh, in integration happens in the chain. And here in case of dried fish, what my, my study found is that the integration is mostly uh, two types. One is a corporate integration is happening where actually um, uh, uh, submit to best kind of operations by big industrialists. They are now having uh, uh, food processing units and they have their own boats, their own trailers and boats. And they also uh, 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 control the whole decision making process. And the, the second is adjusted uh, um, in value integration, uh, vertical integration happening where one chain actor is determining everything. In Bangladesh, yesterday we heard about Aradha. In Odisha also here, we have middlemen and agents who are actually fixing the whole chain. So that actually leaves, there is a strong power asymmetry among the chain uh, actors. There is very low policy and programmatic priorities. So what we have reviewed the entire uh, new policy framework and programs. So if you take the dried fish and the small scale dried fish operations, there is not much policy priority over that. And also well, there are evidences of that entire uh, habitat changing and those who are basically most preferred species for drying is mackerel, oil sardines, anchovy. And there is also clear cut established evidence because of the climate change, there is a shift in habitats happening. And that is also having a strong impact on these small scale operators because they are operating locally and they're processing of the surplus productions. So, um, as I said, there is horizontal and vertical integration happening at a lower segment actors. The, the, the basically trade on the sea is increasing. And with the expanded bill of material uh, structures, this whole new market opportunities are opening in terms of frozen, in terms of uh, live fish market. And also there is also a whole lot of uh, new push towards bycatch because of the less catch in the sea and low production, there is a whole push on bycatch. And in that bycatch new sector, like uh, with the growing sector of uh, inland sector and the poultry and animal husbandry. So there is a full ex uh, exponential uh, growth in the poultry feed and animal feed and this bycatch fits to those food industries. So now there are a lot of such integration is happening at that level. And which is, and also there are uh, evidences here, uh, there is implications of international trade agreements, Asia and SAFTA and and fiscal policies. If you see now, though it's in a small scale, if you see the Indian uh, businesses, they are getting um, uh, 
mackerel, especially very low cost from uh, Thai, uh, Thai and a little bit of Bangladeshi uh, operators. And, and in that sense, um, they supplement, uh, they optimize their production by, by having, because there is a zero duty import and there are all fiscal holidays for them. Uh, so uh, they optimize the production. So that makes this whole blood, this whole, whole division of space and make this local uh, people, uh, their bargaining power low. So this kind of uh, uh, influences are growing in, in this. And, and in case of dried fish, it is exempted for, uh, from the whole uh, GST goods and the service tax of government of India. And that also makes it a uh, little problematic in terms of real data available. People are uh, very skeptical to disclose and there are a lot of trade happens which is not registered. The, so that's create a new, new uh, brings a new challenge for these small scale uh, operators. And there is whole structural barriers to participate in the welfare uh, schemes because of their ability, like there are schemes like contribute and participate schemes. So 50, 30% the fisher will pay and 30% um, government will uh, pay and 30% will come from insurance agencies, uh, but they are not able to uh, participate because they do not have the ability to put that 30%. And most of these uh, uh, fishers we have interviewed about 20% of the fishers are actually available. Second, these, these schemes are available for only people who are into fishing, but there are many people who are not fishing, only processing. They are on the land. So the, we, especially women, they are not getting participated in this kind of schemes. So there are structural barriers. And there is also because, and now uh, there are evidence here that people started uniting themselves and protesting against this uh, big vessels operating in, in their uh, territorial water. Uh, but that has, uh, uh, has ripple effects. So uh, the, in the sense, this whole uh, big operators they could actually mobilize themselves together and they started uh, having new markets on their own um, by doing market on the sea. And now Andhra Pradesh uh, trawlers fetching uh, fish from Odisha and West Bengal trawlers and vice versa. And the landing volume is reducing and so that the poor people who are actually dependent on this small auction and the landing sites, they are completely out of the business. So. Um, while uh, that is the whole uh, complexities that is emerging uh, in the dried fish uh, value chain, in case of upper segment actors, there are also other side of story. Then we said, we have asked why if so much of vulnerability, why you are into the professions? So there are whole uh, other side of the stories like there is, in, they really hang on to their intergenerational knowledge and skill, being a fisher and processors, they really like to have that. And uh, there is also, as aspiration moving up in the value chain ladder by themselves. So there you are- You have two minutes. Yeah, I'll just conclude. Uh, there are people who are uh, human resources and ability to pay a little bit, and they're moving up in the value chain in aggregators and small processors to big processor like that. And there is customary rules, uh, cost identity. These are all uh, very common in this part of the world. And that, makes them uh, to, to really associate with them with the trade. And um, the reimagination in terms of justice perspective, uh, what we argue is that uh, since there is a mixed identity and there is whole foggy uh, connections in the node, so fisheries resources has to be considered as a critical value chain node, uh, whereas the commodity value chain looks at is a, is a inbound logistics or uh, just a enabling uh, environment. So when we talk about fisheries resource as a critical node, then the decision-making process sits in the fisheries systems. And then the tenure access rights becomes very important. And there has to be equal importance to upstream issues. Their performance has to be looked in very different way in terms of, in terms of uh, it should not be looked at only in finance at the gross scale. It has to be looked at every subsystems and performance in terms of well-being. Then there is also uncertainty is, uh, is taken as a risk in terms of value chain and therefore the whole attempt to reduce that risk uh, makes this poor more and more vulnerable because there is a whole uh, uh, cost effectiveness and those kind of things happening, labor dynamics is changing. So if we consider 
uh, uncertainty as one of the critical elements in the value chain and go for multiple equilibrium and multiple type of operations like uh, uh, the earlier presentations, it will open up new, new, uh, pro new opportunities for the poor to participate. So likewise, um, um, there has to be recognition of on-sea and off-sea actors uh, uh, in the whole uh, st uh, structure conduct performance of the value chain. And that could only be possible if you bring a CS perspective with a greater understanding of dynamic linkages, uh, nonlinear feedbacks, uncertainty of emergences issues in that. I have, uh, we have produced just a paper uh, in CRUS last month on this. So anybody interested, I can just forward to this and a lot of argument in that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shishi, for your very nice presentation. Uh, we got lots of information about how small uh, this uh, small scale dry fish worker are connected so many actors and activities and process from uh, for order and breakwork uh, sector. So thank you so much uh, for your presentation and talk. Now um, we have uh, four more minutes. Uh, about uh, discussion and if you have any any of you have any questions or suggestion comments please uh, please proceed uh, if if anybody can i have a questions to yeah, uh, edwina edwina uh, it's really an interesting uh, presentation uh, you actually uh, uh, you actually uh, a uh, lot of scoring and, and, and complex scoring uh, framework. So can you just please little expand how you are actually, what kind of sc scoring methodology you are using by bringing in this kind of complex scoring systems? Sorry, let me see if I understood the question. Um, are you, you're asking how we did the scoring for the different yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so in the case of uh, the the climate and uh, the climate assessment and risk to ecosystems, we basically got a group of people together uh, and went through the tool step by step and allowed people to, to discuss and argue and and uh, and come up with uh, weighted scores for each of the different. Uh, elements that that uh, or attributes that that uh, were identified for this particular uh, fishery and this particular ecosystem, and uh, the, and really in in our experience, this is the best way to do it is to have people sit or sit down with with uh, with others from from other stakeholders who have on the ground experience, and then you have academics, and then also regulators. Uh, and, and decision makers to sit down and really discuss uh, all these different attributes and, and try to find a way to, to rank them or weight them. Uh, and, and it's really a, a tool that we use for, for these kinds of discussions. Then we also did the weighted scoring for some of the socioeconomic aspects. And that, that was done mostly also uh, at the desk uh, with our scientists and uh, different stakeholders as well. Uh, and, and again, uh, this benefited from a lot of discussion and, and uh, arguments and, and uh, very, very uh, dynamic kind of process. So, but if, if you like, we can, we can share our tools uh, with you, uh, with whomever is interested, and they're on uh, the EDF uh, Fishery Solutions Center website as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, World Speaker, for this session. So all of our talk and presentation just highlights how these uh, small-scale fishers are are, are vulnerable to different um, situations which are evolving in different contexts, process and activities. So those, um, they are vulnerable, so, so their vulnerabilities and their crisis and problems are very much context specific. But unfortunately, when the response uh, from policymakers or other sectors come, they just uh, didn't consider about the specific issue that small scale fishers particularly face. So maybe the uh, solution could be uh, fortunately that now over the last uh, few decades, 
the focus on small scale fisheries, uh, fisheries are increasing, so we can hope for the best. And there is there are also some risk about this blue growth and blue economy. So so policymakers as well as researchers should be alert that uh, small scale fisheries and other small scale actors are not uh, go out of the focus of any activities. So so we we can hope that. Uh, in future, the small scale fishers uh, that continue uh, continuously, they will not be marginalized, but they will draw attention from the policymakers and other stakeholders for better future for them. And thank you so much for your nice presentation and discussion. And uh, now we are almost on our time. So thank you so much. Maybe we can go for the next session. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Edwina. I have uh, a message for you. I just answered, no, ma'am. Um, uh, I'll get your... But ma'am, you know the answer jingles, di ba? Yeah. So we'll, we'll be in touch po with you. Uh, we'll email that up. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.